kind of this is kind of new in a sense, but uh, good to see all of you here today. God bless you. And are you ready to take a walk with Jesus? Amen. I tell you what, this scripture that we're going to look at today is going to put you right on the shores of the Jordan River. Right there, we're going to spend a great moment of three days with Jesus. And so I want to give you that chronological breakdown of those three days. And I'm praying, but I know it'll come true, that Jesus will turn the water into wine this morning. He really will for all of us. So good to be here today. The announcements are up on the board, I guess. Are there any other announcements somewhere? Uh, tomorrow is senior luncheon. Senior luncheon at the Pancake, Pancake House. House. It gets up way at noon. Uh, everybody's invited. It's all seniors, but everybody can come. <laughs> all right. Thank you very much. Thank you. What's on the menu? Whatever you want. Whatever you want. <laughs> pancakes? Pancakes and more pancakes, right? All right. Welcome to everybody. Good to have you here today. Pray for Brother Jim and Kathy. It was Jim's birthday yesterday, so who knows what shape he's in today. <laughs> but uh, it's all good. We'll find out next week, I guess, when we talk to him. But uh, let's go to the Lord in prayer, shall we? Our gracious Father in heaven, again, we praise you for who you are. Thank you for revealing yourself to us in the person of Jesus. Oh, Father, we bow before our Christ, our Lord, and we give him the honor and the glory. May you bless us today with your presence as we wait upon your Holy Spirit to fall upon us so that we might get excited about the salvation we have in Christ Jesus and the reality of the future promises that are all wrapped up in God's word to us. So we ask that you'd guide us now, bless these that are here today in a special way, be with the singers and Father, musicians, and may this whole house be full of just your glory. And we pray it in Jesus' name. And they all said amen. 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 Oh, good morning, everybody. Good morning. It's wonderful to see you all. Who's been enjoying the new autumn weather we've been receiving lately? Not me. I know. Some people don't like it, but I like the rain. It's too wet. We had no rain. I know, but it's still too wet. Pouring down sun, and now you say it's too wet. This is sad. We're never happy. Never. <laughs> well, let's see if we can get happy and sing to our Lord. Please stand. <laughs> Yeah. 
He's strong, isn't he? Praise the Lord. Well, young people, and I know they're young in age, but they are very, very mature in the spirit. We'll learn that through Sunday school, and I thank their parents and grandparents and everybody that's involved in teaching these young children about Jesus. And you know, it's interesting, isn't it, to see them know the Bible stories that you and I are really, really, really familiar with, but then they can expand on it. Even when you're trying to teach them something, they're teaching you all these wonderful things. And that's the beauty of growing, isn't it? Growing in grace, as Peter said, in the knowledge and in the knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, young children, let me ask you something. Do you have old clothes that you play in? Okay. Now, do you have school clothes that are separate than your old clothes? All right. And you probably have Sunday go to meeting school meeting clothes, right? Right. Well, I have right here some of my clothes. Now, the beautiful thing about this is that this is a work shirt. This is one that I use around the house and outside. Now, it's kind of faded, isn't it? And not only that, but you know what? It's got a hole here, right? It's got a whole bunch of holes in the back. And someday, this shirt is going to go into the garbage and I'll never see it again. But I will have a memory of it. Now, this is another shirt right here that I have that I would not wear outside digging in the dirt, cutting firewood, that kind of a thing. But I'd wear this if I was to go out for dinner or something like that or go to a casual meeting place and meet somebody for lunch or something like that. It's a pretty nice shirt. But this one is probably four or five years old at least. This one here might be a couple years old. And then, um, moi, fashion statement, huh? Here's a shirt here. Now, it's an older shirt, too. But I chose to wear this one because I think it's a little more colorful than the blue one and this old faded one here. Now, at one time, these clothes were all brand spanking new. And I was excited about that. Just like your play clothes. They were brand new, and you accepted them as brand new play clothes, amen, or were brand new clothes. But then as time went on, they became your outside clothes, the ones that you play in. And then the ones that you go to school, those were brand new, but they're gotten a little older, and you wear them just for school, not for coming to church on Sunday necessarily. But your Sunday clothes are the ones that you really, really, really put aside in a special place for just that purpose of coming to church. Now, unfortunately, a lot of people don't get a continual sense of excitement after they have their clothes for a while. And what do they do? They look for new clothes, right? And some of your closets are full of clothes <laughs> that are old but yet like brand new. The point is this. When you pull out from the dresser or from the closet your play clothes, remember how excited you were about those? But it's time that you, when you pull out your school clothes, it's time to be even as excited about those clothes as you were about the other clothes, the play clothes. And then when you come to church and you put on your church clothes, you're excited about that. Here's the point. You would not diminish... Your excitement concerning your clothes, if in fact those clothes were given to you every day, brand spank new. But our human nature says this, sometimes I like my old clothes better than my new clothes. They're comfortable or whatever. And sometimes we don't want new clothes because the old clothes are where our comfort zone is. It can be the same way in your walk with Jesus, young people. You can remember when you first accepted Jesus, how excited you were, right? But God's got greater things for you to know about him than just knowing that you're his child. He's got a lot of new clothes for you to try on spiritually. And then, the best of all, 
those clothes will be placed upon you when we all get to heaven and see God in all of his glory. Amen? Amen. So just remember, don't get real excited about your old clothes. Get real excited about your new clothes. And then get really excited about your spiritual clothes that God's going to place on you when he tells you, well done, thou good and faithful servant. So may God bless you, young people. Keep going for Jesus. Amen? Amen. Amen. It always amazes me how people can play the piano or an instrument and sing at the same time. It's like chewing gum, rubbing your belly. and Huh? <laughs> Surprises you too? <laughs> Amen. Well, how about that? Praise God. Well, again, good morning, and uh, are you ready to get into God's Word? Praise the Lord for that. Aren't you glad we have the Word of God? Amen. Amen. This morning I've chosen uh, John chapter 2, verses 9 through 11 to talk to you about this morning. And I pray, as I mentioned this morning, God will take the wine uh, that uh, was turned into water and enrich us with that understanding of who He is and what he's provided for us. I want to read John chapter 2 verses 9 through 11. John chapter 2 verses 9 through 11. Now you are probably familiar with the marriage feast in Cana of Galilee. And uh, you probably have heard the message somewhere along the line in your Christian experience about this event that Jesus performed his first miracle. And so Right at the end of that particular event that's recorded in John chapter uh, 2, the word of the Lord says this, verse 9. And the ruler of the feast had tasted, excuse me, when the ruler of the feast had tasted the water that was made wine, and knew not whence it was, but the servants which drew the water knew, the governor of the feast called the bridegroom and said unto him, Every man at the beginning does set forth good wine. And when men have well drunk, then that which is worse, but thou hast kept the good wine until now. This beginning of miracles did Jesus in Cana of Galilee and manifested forth his glory and his disciples believed on him. Let us pray. Father in heaven, we thank you for your word. We thank you for what it means to us as believers in Christ, as disciples of the Lord Jesus and as brothers and sisters in the Lord. Father, I'm glad that we are part of the family of God. We pray now that you would anoint your word. May the Holy Spirit have his way in all of our hearts. And may we, Father, be enriched with the word as you turn this water into wine and that joy that's accompanying it as well. Bless Brother Jim and Kathy and their travels, Lord. Watch over them and strengthen them. And again, I thank you for all the folks in the church here this morning. Pray that you'll guide us and direct us. And we ask all of these things in the precious name of Jesus, our Lord and Savior. And they all said, Amen. Amen. Now I want to begin at the beginning of this section that's recorded for us in John's Gospel. The beginning of this section begins actually in chapter 1, verse 19. And then it concludes in chapter 2, verse 11, the verses that I just read. So this whole section is important for us to understand what the climax of this first sec second section of the book of John is really about and how it would imply or impact our lives as brothers and sisters. Of course, you know the first part of John's gospel in the beginning was the word, the word was with God. The word became flesh. You know that recorded word that's given to us in the first section of John chapter 1. The second section begins, like I said, in verse 19. And here's what verse 19 says. And this is the record of John when the Jews sent priests and Levites from Jerusalem to ask him, Who art thou? So John through the Spirit, tells us who Jesus is. He's the Word of God that was with God in the beginning. Amen? God came in the Word. The Word of God came, dwelt among us. We beheld His glory. Now, that exciting message that was given to John by God Almighty 
began to move in his heart in such a way that he began to declare repent for the kingdom of God is at hand. As that message went out, many people came to hear the preaching of John. And many of them surrendered to that preaching. Many of them were baptized of John. Many of them began to follow John. As their leader, their teacher, they became disciples of John. Amen? Now, after that was done, here comes the religious leaders, the Jewish people. And they come to John and say, who are you? Are you the Christ? And John says, no, I'm not the Christ. He says, I'm not the Christ at all. Well, they said, if you're not the Christ, then who are you? Are you one of the prophets? Are you the prophet that Moses talked about? Are you, in fact, Jeremiah? Are you Elijah? If you're not the Christ, then are you one of these other people? And Jesus said, or excuse me, John said, no. I'm none of those. I'm the one that Isaiah said was going to come to preach and to prepare the way of the Lord. They said, well, how come you're doing this when in fact the Sanhedrin haven't given you any permission? Because the Sanhedrin was the only ones that gave permission for people to baptize Why were they to baptize people? They were to baptize people to bring them into the covenant relationship that the Jews had with the covenant that Abraham and God made. Included in baptism was circumcision. So if you were a proselyte, then you had to be circumcised and you had to be baptized. That then gave you the right to come into the quote, unquote, covenant relationship that the Jewish people had with God. Now, John says this. He says, you know what? He says, my mission is different than that. I'm baptizing with water. Oh, they baptized with water and circumcised. But he said, my mission is different in that I'm asking you, God has told me to tell you to repent of your sins. See, the Jewish people had people that came in. They were just as sinful as they were before they became covenant people of God, so to speak. And so John says, my mission and message is repent, repentance. And not only that, but believe in the Messiah, the Christ. That's the criteria that I've been given so that you might enter into this covenant with God that was all typified within what has happened in the, in the past. Now, when that was all said and done, then John says this. You know what? God has sent the Messiah, and he's even among you today, is what he was telling the people. So I want to have you get in your mind's eye. You're standing on the Uh, sides of the the, uh, uh, Jordan River. It's a nice day. Many people are around. This conversation has just concluded. People are coming to get baptized. And John says, you know what? Repent for the kingdom of God is at hand. And the Messiah is standing among you. Now get this. As John looks at the crowd, and as we look at the crowd, Do you know what? There's one person that he recognizes for sure. And that one person is his cousin, Jesus. He says to himself, hey, there's my cousin. Now, John might have knew Jesus as a son of David, because that was their family, right? But he said, I didn't know him. Until God told me that the one that you see, the dove, fall on and abide on permanently. He's the Messiah. So can you imagine the astonishment of John when Jesus comes to him and says, I need you to baptize me. 
John says, wait a minute, you're a more righteous person. He recognized that. He said, you're a more righteous person than I am. Jesus said, suffer it so to be, for such is the kingdom of God. And when John baptized his cousin, up comes Jesus. And what happens? The heavens open up. There's a voice from heaven. This is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. And when that happened, John said, you know what? This is God. This is not only my cousin, but he is now revealed to us and to me as God's only begotten son. Now, the interesting thing about that is this, that when Jesus comes up out of the water, John had already declared, you know what? Behold the Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world. And he says, and I saw and bear record that this is the Son of God. Matter of fact, Jesus confirms that in chapter 5. He says, you know what? If I give a witness of myself, that's one thing. But there's another that bears witness of me, and he tells you the truth. Jesus was saying that John bore the truth that I'm not only the Messiah, the Lamb of God that was going to come to take away the sin of the world, but I am God's divine Son. I am, in fact, God manifest in the flesh. That's a true statement from John. Now, we know that Jesus, as soon as he came up out of the water, what happened? The dove lit on him. The voice from heaven, God said, this is my son. And then immediately this Holy Spirit does what? Takes him into the wilderness and there he's tempted of the devil. Right? Now, after all that, Jesus comes back. And guess who's baptizing still? John. And guess who has some disciples around him? John. And Jesus comes John gives a testimony about Jesus, and then two of those disciples, seeing Jesus, said, Hey, Jesus, where do you live? Where do you abide? And all that. Jesus said, Who do you seek? Those are the first recorded words that Jesus spoke in John, by the way. Who are you seeking? And they said, we, we want to know where you live. And they, he says, come, follow me. Those are the second words. And then, in that situation, you see Andrew and John are the two disciples. Andrew then goes and tells who? His brother, who? Peter, right? We found a Messiah. Peter comes along the way. The three of them, along with Jesus, begin to have fellowship. Then, the Bible says, the next day, in the morning, Philip and Nathaniel are two more disciples that are brought into the fold of, with Jesus Christ. So now you have Jesus, Andrew, John, you have Peter, you have Philip, and Nathaniel. You have six of them. And the two, Nathaniel and Philip, were involved in God's work through Jesus in the p.m. of the third day. The a.m. of the third day. The p.m. of the third day, Jesus now... And his five disciples are at the wedding and the marriage feast in Cana of Galilee. And as he then mingles and the wedding feast is taking place, who shows up? Mary. Mary was already there with other guests, already there. And she says, Jesus, they're running low on the wine. Do something about that. He says, Woman, my power, my time is not yet. Right? My time's not yet. 
But as soon as she moved out of the way, she represents Israel. As soon as she moves out of the way, then Jesus tells the servants, get that water, fill in those pots, and dip it out and distribute that wine to the guests. Now, I've said all that to say this. These scriptures, if I can have them on the board one more time, say this. I think they're, there they are. When the ruler of the feast had tasted the water that was made in wine, and knew not whence it was, but the servants drew the water, knew, the governor of the feast called the bridegroom. Now, usually in a big wedding, there were three tables assigned to a manager. So if you had... Six tables, you had two managers. Nine, uh, three tables, you, or, or what, uh, 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 nine tables, you had three managers. So here are these managers attending the guests that are seated at their three tables. There wasn't enough wine to go around after the third day of the feast. So they needed some wine. And so the next verse says this, And said unto him, the bridegroom, Every man at the beginning does set forth good wine, and when men have well drunk, then that which is worse. But thou hast kept the good wine until now. Now, this word worst, wherever it's at right here, is kind of a bad word when we think about it. But the good wine, which was given first, I wrote this down. It expresses beauty as a harmonious completeness, balanced. Its proportion is just right. So the wine that was, he said, usually given in the beginning is the most precious wine you can get. It's the good wine. It's the best wine. Now, after you've drank that wine, the guests have drunk that wine. Now, by the way, they didn't get drunk in drinking that wine. The word of God says, according to the Old Testament, <clears throat> that when the rain came and saturated the land, that means not one drop too much or one drop too less was given by God to saturate the land or to, to water the land. So they had just the, just the right amount to experience the joy of the Lord. Now, the worst wine isn't the ugh wine, but what it is, is this. It is the smaller in size, quantity, quality, age, it's less, or it's not as much. So, putting it in simple terms, the vintage wine is what they sell, or not sell, but distribute first, and then the Wine that's not as old is what's given next. So if you had wine that was bottled in 1820, that was the first. If you had wine that was bottled then in 1937, that's the worst wine. That's the stuff that's not aged as well. So the not aged as well wine is usually what he says the governors distribute in the end. But look at this. He says, but thou hast kept the good wine until now. That means there's something beyond the very first good wine that he's talking about. Now, let's look at this for just a minute. Verse 11 says this. This beginning of miracles did Jesus in Cana of Galilee and manifested forth his glory and his disciples believed on him. Now that's the summation of what 1 John, or excuse me, John chapter 1, 19 says. There's, bless you, there's a verse that says this. It's right here, verse 29. John had given his testimony. The next day shows up. It says, The next day John seeth Jesus coming unto him and saith, Behold the Lamb of God, which takes away the sin of the world. 
And then later on he testifies, I saw and bear record that this is the Son of God. The wine of the first day is the wine in which God, the Son, the Lamb of God, provides for you and for me redemption. When Jesus sums all this up, he says, the good wine, the not so good wine, in other words, in terms of age, the worst wine is the wine of seeing Jesus as the Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world. Now, when you think of worst wine, that doesn't mean that's not very good. That's really good news, isn't it? That's really good joy. That really makes us happy. But when he says the good wine that was given fur later, he says that wine is the wine of the second day. Listen to this. The next day, or excuse me, it says, Again the next day after John stood and two of his disciples are looking upon Jesus, as he walked, saith, Behold the Lamb of God. The second day's wine, or the second wine, is Jesus after his resurrection. Remember, he comes, presents himself, goes to the wilderness, manifests himself to be strong, and now he comes. That second day's wine is Jesus, not as the Redeemer, but as the one that is to lead the way and to provide for you and for me absolutely the better wine or the joy of meditation. The third day, that wine is the wine that we're going to experience when we get to heaven, when the millennial kingdom takes place, when in fact God and his Brothers and sisters, God and his disciples get together, and what do they see? They'll see the manifestation of his glory in its full orb expressed in that day. What are we trying to say? <clears throat> We're trying to say is that for you and for me to just dwell upon our redemption in Christ Jesus is a wonderful thing and ought to bring joy to our hearts when we think of the forgiveness of sins that have been provided by the sinless, spotless Lamb of God that took away the sin of the world. Amen? That is exciting to think about. And that should never be diminished for sure. Amen? But do you know what? The second day's wine is better yet. Because what it is, it's God the Son manifesting himself to us as our leader, teacher, and wow, what a joy it is to understand more about God in Jesus Christ and the full glory that he represents as the light of the world, the bread of life, the water, you name it, that's expressed in the word of God, our high priest, the mediator between God and men, the man Christ Jesus, when you begin to meditate upon the Savior that redeemed you, that's better wine. That should bring better joy to your heart and my heart. It's like these clothes. Too many people are still rejoicing in the work clothes. They were new one time. You were excited about it. But there's new clothes to be discovered and developed and to understand when we meditate upon Almighty God and what he's done for you and for me. Now, the Bible says this. First words Jesus said in the Gospel of John was come and see. What that means is this. I'm the center of this experience. Come and see. Come and see what I've done for you. Come and see what's available for you after redemption. Come and see the glory that I provided for you. Come and see it. But you can only come and see it then when you follow me. 
follow me, he says. Come and follow me. Come and see. Too many people stop at redemption and the cross. And they get a taste of the glory, you might say. After about a year or so, it's not so exciting, so they go back to the cross. And they never grow in grace and the knowledge of the Lord Jesus. The writer of Hebrews says, you know what? The basic stuff, we can touch on those things if God permit. But there's greater things to know about Jesus and God's plan of redemption. That's the, I mean, I'm telling you what, that's the beauty of our relationship with God. Is that he reveals to us what we need to know about him as we follow Jesus and make him the center of our life. And not only that, but the wine of the third day. Think about that. What is the wine of the third day? The wine of the third day, (sighs) many of our loved ones are experiencing the love of God, the joy of God. And they're seeing, have seen, the manifested glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. We're not there yet. The half has not yet been told to us. But they, our loved ones that have gone into glory, have seen. What have they seen? They've seen God manifest, put forth his glory. And I'm telling you what, it's got to be a glorious sight for sure, isn't it? You see, redemption is awesome. As a matter of fact, let me just say this. You cannot know Jesus as God unless God reveals it to you, first of all. So, if we stand in the place of a privileged person, knowing that God through Christ saved our soul through the work of Jesus, and that that revelation came by God himself to us, Shouldn't that move us so that we want to know more about what God has in store for us? More about what God intends to do in and through us as believers. We need not stop short of the pathway that God has provided for us to walk in individually, each and every one of us. There'll come a time when we'll Move from this life to the next. But we'll never stop seeing the glory of God manifested in the glorious person of Jesus Christ. You see, what's exciting, here's what Paul said. He said this in uh, Ephesians chapter 3. If I can find it here real quick. Ephesians 3. There it is right here. Oh, that's Hebrews. Anyway. Forgive me here for stumbling I had it marked, but it's... Oh, well, come on. Come on. Here it is. Ephesians 3, 3. Now that by revelation he made known unto me the mystery, as I wrote afore in a few words. In other words, God revealed to Paul the mystery of the revelation that God had in his heart concerning the church way back when. That's been revealed by revelation to the Apostle Paul. We have been given that same exposure. Because we have, whoops, I don't know where it went. We have been given the word of God. The lid's been taken off of this mystery. And we see the full beauty of Almighty God. The wine of the first day is redemption. And there's joy in that for sure. Amen? The wine of the second day is God the Son in manifestation of himself, in meditating on him. And the wine of the third day is that in which we wait for when we'll see Jesus and understand the other side of the glory of Almighty God. You've heard about, oh, I'm being... I'm justified, I'm being sanctified, I'll be glorified. You see Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, Acts, then you see the epistles, and then Revelation. It's all talking about seeing God in the flesh 
as the Redeemer. Experiencing then the Christian life and then the hope of glory. It won't be a path to walk on. It'll be a highway of gold that you and I will enjoy forever and ever. So brothers and sisters, we will say this. The wine of the first day was good to the master. And we will say, you know what? The wine of the second day was better. But we'll say on the third day, but thou hast kept the best wine until now. So the millennial kingdom will be the father's house of wine. And the joy of that house will be the joy and love of an eternal marriage feast. <laughs> Think about it. An eternal, eternal marriage feast in which God will reveal himself to us in his full, full glory. Are you looking forward to that? Let's not diminish the cross and our redemption but let's look forward to greater things that are coupled with that that uh, uh, are given to us to expand our understanding of what God's done for us in Christ Jesus and then we'll always learn and always know and understand that and then when we step across Jordan we will see everything that God's intended for us to see may the Lord bless you let us pray. Father in heaven, we thank you for your love for us. We thank you for what you have done in sharing with us this first or second section of the day, days and events of those days culminating in the third day in which the marriage feast of Cana of Galilee was enjoyed by Jesus and his disciples. Oh, Father, there's joy and redemption, deeper joy in meditating upon the Word of God. But the deepest joy is yet to be revealed when we see Jesus in his fullness. And we praise God for that. So help us, I pray, not to not grow in grace and in the knowledge of the Lord. Help us all, Father to anticipate that new cloth, cloth, new clothing, the robe of righteousness which the Son of God will place upon us. Yes, Jesus used the marriage feast of Cain of Galilee as an emblem of that great day in which he, the bridegroom, adorned in all of his glory for come, shall come for the church which is purchased with his own blood. And she shall be dressed in the spotless garments of his righteousness. Oh, we give you the glory and praise. Thank you for turning the water into wine for us even today. And we pray this in Jesus' name. And they all said amen. amen. And we're going to give an invitation <clears throat> right now as the singers sing a little bit. If you want to come and pray, uh, if you want to make a commitment to the Lord, maybe you're just stuck at the cross, so to speak. Good place to be stuck, but move forward as you anticipate the Lord. If you have a need today, won't you come as we stand?
and we sing. 